Think and Grow Rich, Chapter 5, Specialized Knowledge, Part 6. The idea here described was born of necessity to, br to bridge an emergency which had to be covered. But it did not stop the merely serving one person. The woman who created the idea has keen imagination. She saw in her newly born brainchild the uh, making of a new profession, one that is designed to render valuable service to thousands of people who need practical guidance in marketing personal services. Spared to action by the instances, instantaneous success of her first prepared plan to market personal services, this energetic woman turned next to the solution of similar problem for her son, who had just finished college, but had been totally unable to find a market for the service or for his service. The plan she organized or originated for his use was the finest specimen of a merchandising personal services I have ever seen. When the plan book had been completed, it contained nearly 50 pages of beautifully typed, properly organized information telling the story of her son's native abilities, schooling, personal experiences, and a great variety of other information too extensive for description. The plan book also contained a complete description of the position her son desired together with the marvelous word pictured of the exact plan he would use in filling the position. The preparation of the book required several weeks of labor during which time its creator sent her son to the public libraries almost daily to procure data needed in selling this, his services to the best advantage. She sent him also to all the competitors of his prospective employer and gathered from them vital information concerning their business methods, which was of great value in the formation of the plan he intended to use in filling the position he sought. When the plan had been finished, it contained more than a half a dozen very fine suggestions for the use of the benefit of the prospective employer. The suggestions were put into use by the company. One may be inclined to ask, why go all through all this trouble to secure a job? The answer is straight to the point. Also, it is dramatic because it deals with the subject which assumes the proportion of the tragedy which million of men and women whose sole source of income is personal services. The answer is, doing a thing well never is trouble. The plan prepared by this woman for the benefit of her son helped him get the job for which he applied at the first interview at the salary fixed by himself. Moreover, and this too is important, the position did not require the young man to start at the bottom. He began it as a junior executive at the executive salary. Why go through all the trouble, do you ask? Well, for one thing, the planned presentation of the young man's application for the position clipped off no less than 10 years of time he would have required to get to where he began had he started at the bottom and worked his way up. The idea of starting at the bottom and working one's way up may appear to be sound, but the major objection is, to it is this. Too many of those begin at the bottom, never manage to lift their heads high enough to see or to be seen by opportunity. So they remain at the bottom. It should be remembered also that the outlook from the bottom is not so very bright or encouraging. It, is, it has a tendency to kill off ambition. We call it getting into a rut, which means that we accept our fate because we form the habit of daily routine, a habit that finally becomes uh, so strong we cease to try to throw it off. Okay, hear that too good. And 
That is another reason why it pays to start one or two steps above the bottom. By so doing, one forms the habit of looking around or observing how others get ahead, of seeing opportunity, and of embracing it without hesitation. Dan Happily is a splendid example of what I mean. During his college days, he was a manager of the famous 1930 National Championship Notre Dame football team when it was under the direction of the late Canute Rockney. Perhaps he was impressed by the great football coach to aim high and not mistake temporary defeat for failure, just as Andrew Carnegie, the great industrial leader, inspired his young business lieutenants to set high goals for themselves. At any rate, the young Haplin finished college at a mighty unfavorable time when the Depression had made jobs scarce. So after a fling of investment banking and motion pictures, it took the first opening with the potential future he could find, selling electrical hearing aids on a commission basis. Anyone could start in the, that sort of job, and Haplin knew it but it was enough to open the door of opportunity to him. For almost two years, he continued in the job of not to his liking, and he would never have risen above that job if he had not done something about the dissatisfaction. He aimed first at the job of assistant sales manager of his company and got that job. That one step upward placed him high enough above the crowd to enable him to see still greater opportunity. Also, it placed him where opportunity could see him. He made such a fine record selling hearing aids that A. M. Andrews, chairman of the board of the Dictorfo, the Dictograph Products Company, a business competitor of the company for which Haplin worked, wanted to know something about that man Dan Haplin, who was taking big sales away from the long established Dictograph sales manager in charge of the Acousticon division, then to test young Haplin's metal, Mr. Anderson went away to Florida for three months, leaving him to sink or swim in his new job. He did not sink. Nuke Rockney, spirit of all the world, loves a winner and has no time for a loser, inspired him to put so much into his job that he was recently elected vice president of the company and general manager of the Acousticon and Silent Radio Division, a job which most men would be proud to earn through 10 years of loyal effort. Haplin turned the trick in little than six months.